Hi, everybody. My name is Amy Vega. Welcome back to Holy Spirit Revealed This Today. I'm going to be sharing with you what Holy Spirit's been revealing to me each morning, uh, starting with April 24th through today. And today is May the 2nd, 2024. And um, there's been a lot going on this week. I have a lot of uh, photos to share with you um, with some supernatural things I've been seeing. And I'm, I did receive a suggestion from somebody who apparently listens while she works and can't actually watch. She just listens. And so she suggested I put the photos at the end of the video. So I'm doing that. I was putting them in the order that I saw them. So I just switched everything around to just put the photos at the end. So for those that are multitasking, um, you can just listen and um, tune into the photos later uh, when you have time to watch. So I appreciate that you're tuning in and listening to what Holy Spirit wants to reveal to us. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I do share biblical numbers also, and there's information in the description box about the resource for biblical numbers. Um, they are biblical, not new age. Um, and all of my social media and um, my blog link is also in the description box. Oftentimes in the blog, I can include a little bit more detailed information than I can like on an X post or a true social post. And so the blog um, posts are have a little bit more information sometimes. Um, and all the photos that I'm sharing will be, um, if they're not there now, they will shortly be um, put on the blog. And I have I can't always show with the drawing here on the video because I have too many and it won't let me load that many pictures on here for the video. So um, on my blog though, if you click on the picture, then it has more pictures and I've drawn on some of them. So if you are having a hard time seeing what um, what I'm seeing or what the, what the host actually looks like or the whatever that is up there that I'm taking a picture of, um, there's drawings on that stuff. So you can go to the blog. And I just want to say that I give all glory to God for everything that I'm sharing, um, for all the things that he reveals to me. And um, this week was pretty neat because, you know, the enemy tried to get in the way uh, one of the mornings and the Lord quickly got me back on track. So I'll be sharing that with you and really confirmed. Um, and so, and then and like a couple days later, confirmed again. So um, pretty neat. So very appreciative. Um, that Jesus is very attentive to our hearts. And, um, you know, if we're feeling any doubt or, or the enemy is trying to interfere in any way with what he's trying to, to do with us and use us for. So I just want to go ahead and pray this in to make sure we have good communication and everything goes well. So Father, right now I release your glory and your healing upon all who are watching this video. And in the name of Jesus, I dispatch your warring angels, communication angels, and camouflage angels to protect this video recording, to place a hedge of protection around me, my family, my home, around all who are watching this recording and their families, and to hide this video from the enemy. I declare Isaiah 54, 17, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper, and every tongue that rises up against us we shall show to be in the wrong. And your word in Luke 10, 19 says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will harm you. And your word in Matthew 16, verse 19 says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Right now, I sever all witchcraft off of me, my family, off of all who are watching this video, off of our homes, off of our ministries, and off of our social media platforms. I bind every demon, and I cast you out of here to the dry places to remain there bound and not return and not send any back in your place. I kick you out of here, and I cancel all your assignments. I render every demon deaf, dumb, blind, and paralyzed. I forbid you from manifesting in our homes against our family members and their homes, against our health or our pet's health, against our electronics, our appliances, our vehicles, and our plumbing. And I forbid you from sabotaging this broadcast or any of our social media platforms in any shape or form. Only the Holy Spirit can manifest here. And Holy Spirit, you're invited to have your way with this broadcast. Holy Spirit, have your way with me. Amen. 
Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, April 24th, I was led to Zechariah 6. Um, God, and it, um, I titled it, God Will Swiftly Destroy Modern Babylon. So I prayed, I wrote, I prayed in the spirit and invited Holy Spirit to lead me to scripture he wants me to see today. He instructed me to open my Bible to a random page. So I did that with my eyes closed. Then he said to turn 12 pages. So I did that and I was at Zechariah 6. And this is the third time that I've been led to Zechariah 6. And I wrote, with his angels, God will destroy modern Babylon. His judgment is sure and it will be swift. So swift, most people would be caught unaware. In Zechariah 6, 1 through 8 in the Berean Study Bible, stood out to me. And again, I lifted up my eyes and saw four chariots coming out from between two mountains, mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black horses, the third white horses, and the fourth dappled horses, all of them strong. So I inquired of the angel who was speaking with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel told me, these are the four spirits of heaven going forth from their station before the Lord of all the earth. The one with the black horses is going toward the land of the north, the one with the white horses toward the west, and the one with the dappled horses toward the south. As the strong horses went out, they were eager to go and patrol the earth, and the Lord said, go and patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. Then the Lord summoned me and said, behold, these going to the land of the north have given rest to my spirit in the land of the north. Okay, so then when I posted that on X, I received a timestamp of 1145. So that led me to Psalm 114. So I was looking up um, Psalm uh, 114, verse 5 for 1145. Anyway, um, the name of the psalm is a psalm of Exodus. Isn't that interesting? All right, so... Um, yeah, so you can go and read that. That whole psalm is um, Psalm of Exodus. Neat. Um, and also the number 11, God's judgment falling upon disorder, transition, 11th hour, valor, notable acts of self-service to others. 45 made me think of Isaiah 45 and the Cyrus anointing on um, present number 45. In October 539 BCE, the Persian King Cyrus took Babylon, the ancient capital of an Oriental empire covering modern Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. In a broader sense, Babylon was the ancient world's capital of scholarship and science. The subject provinces soon recognized Cyrus as their legitimate ruler. That's interesting because, um, we're in the time of two presidents. So the prophecy by Kim Clement that, we, that we've got two presidents right now. So if you've been following that stuff, you know what I mean. Um, so let's see what I got here. Okay, so Isaiah 45. This is what the Lord says to Cyrus, his anointed, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him to disarm kings, to open the doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break down the gates of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. So that reminds me of um, something that um, President 45 posted recently on Truth, social media, um, about a capitulation tour where he went from country to country and... I mean, like in Saudi Arabia, they did the the sword dance with him and stuff. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen one, I call you by name. I have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God but me. I will equip you for battle, though you have not known me, so that all may know from where the sun rises to where it sets that there is none but me. I am the Lord and there is no other. 
I form the light and create the darkness. I bring prosperity and create calamity. And I, the Lord, do all these things. Drip down, O heavens, from above and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open up that salvation may sprout and righteousness spring up with it. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to him who quarrels with his maker. One clay pot among many. Does the clay ask the potter, what are you making? Does your work say he has no hands? Woe to him who says to his father, what have you begotten? Or to his mother, what have you brought forth? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and its maker. How dare you question me about my sons or instruct me in the work of my hands? It is I who made the earth and created man upon it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens and I ordained all their host. I will raise up Cyrus in righteousness and I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free, but not for payment or reward, says the Lord of hosts. This is what the Lord says. The products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush along with the Sabians, men of stature, will come over to you and will be yours. They will trudge behind you. Reminds me of the queen walking behind number 45. They will come over in chains and bow down to you. They will confess to you. God is indeed with you and there is no other. There is no other God. Truly, you are God. You are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel the savior they will all be put to shame and humiliated the makers of idols will depart together in disgrace but israel will be saved by the lord with an everlasting salvation you will not be put to shame or humiliated to ages everlasting for thus says the lord who created the heavens he is god he formed the earth and fashioned it he established it he did not create it to be empty but formed it to be inhabited I am the Lord and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret from a place in a land of darkness. I did not say to the descendants of Jacob, seek me in a wasteland. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I say what is right. Come, gather together and draw near, you fugitives from the nations. Ignorant are those who carry idols of wood and pray to a God that cannot save. Speak up and present your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who foretold this long ago? Who announced it from ancient times? Was it not I, the Lord? There is no other God but me, a righteous God and Savior. There is none but me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, I have sworn, truth has gone out from my mouth, a word that will not be revoked. Every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will swear allegiance. Surely they will say of me, in the Lord alone are righteousness and strength. All who rage against him will come to him and be put to shame. In the Lord, all descendants of Israel will be justified and will exalt. Wow. So that's what that reminded me of. And this was amazing. Um, Later in the evening on the same day, I was kind of browsing through Instagram and I saw somebody posted a photo, like a news story of some horses running through London. I was like, whoa. And one of them was a white horse that had blood all over it. And the other one was a black horse. And I think there were more than those ones, but those were the ones in on the photo that I saw. And I was like, whoa, I need to look this up and see if this really happened. And so I, it was confirmed that it happened. Um, and so it was this news article. So about six riders and seven horses from the lifeguards, part of the household cavalry, were running loose through the streets of the city of London, which is the financial stronghold of the deep S-T-A-T-E. All right. So if you add six riders and seven horses together that's six plus seven that's 13 which 13 stands for rebellion for one thing um and i thought it was interesting because i was just led to zechariah six that morning and the black and white horses are sent to babylon for judgment 
and that white horse had red blood on it. So oh, I was like, okay, that's prophetic. And then as I started, as I um, continued to kind of watch the news on that, I saw that Big Ben, which is the large clock over there, stopped right at nine o'clock, unexplainably stopped at nine o'clock. Nine is judgment. Okay. And then what was the other thing I found out about that? I want to say that at 10 o'clock, it rang 11 times. So that was the other piece of it. So the, the clock stopped at nine o'clock and at 10 o'clock when it started working again at 10 o'clock, it rang 11 times. So they couldn't figure out what was wrong with the clock, but nine, 11, whoa. So nine is judgment. 11 is judgment. Um, and 11 is transition also. So I'm looking here. So it made me think of Zechariah six, verse six with the chariot, with the black horses going toward the North country. Then with the one with the white horses follows after them because there are two Northern powers to overcome. And the chariot with the dappled horses goes toward the South country. Very interesting. That was totally prophetic. All right, so I'm looking. Um, so the next day, April 25th, I was led to Zechariah 12, um, and I titled it War Bulletin, God's Message Concerning Israel. So I prayed in the spirit and felt the presence of Holy Spirit. And then I asked him to lead me to scripture. He wants me to see that day and to give me wisdom and understanding and revelation. So he instructed me to open my Bible to a random page, which again, I did with my eyes closed. Then he told me to turn five pages and I found myself at Zechariah 12. And this is the fourth time that I've been led to that scripture. And I wrote, we are living in the big day when Jesus will miraculously deliver Israel from all of their enemies and will sovereignly remove the spiritual blindness from his people. Then they will recognize Jesus, the one they'd rejected and pierced, was and is their Messiah. That's going to be quite a day when that happens. Um, and so the scripture that I got was Zechariah 12, verses 1 through 14 in the message translation and it says, War Bulletin, God's message concerning Israel, God's decree, the very God who threw the skies into space, set earth on a firm foundation and breathed his own life into men and women. Watch for this. I'm about to turn Jerusalem into a cup of strong drink that will have the people who have set siege to Judah and Jerusalem staggering in a drunk, drunken stupor. On the big day, I'll turn Jerusalem into a huge stone, blocking the way for everyone. All who try to lift it will rupture themselves. All the pagan nations will come together and try to get rid of it. On the big day, this is God speaking, I'll throw all the war horses into a crazed panic and their riders along with them, but I'll keep my eye on Judah, watching out for her at the same time, that I make the enemy horses go blind. The families of Judah will then realize why our leaders are strong and able through God of the angel armies, their personal God. On the big day, I'll turn the families of Judah into something like a burning match in a tinder dry forest, like a fiercely flaming torch in a barn full of hay. They'll burn up in everything and everyone in sight, people to the right, people to the left, while Jerusalem fills up with people moving in and making themselves at home, home again in Jerusalem. I, God, will begin to by restoring the common households of Judah so that the glory of David's family and the leaders in Jerusalem won't overshadow the ordinary people in Judah. On the big day, I'll look after everyone who lives in Jerusalem so that the lowliest weak person will be as glorious as David and the family of David itself will be godlike, like the angel of God leading the people. On the big day, I'll make a clean sweep of all the godless nations that fought against Jerusalem. Next, I'll deal with the family of David and those who live in Jerusalem. I'll pour a spirit of grace and prayer over them. They'll then be able to recognize me 
as the one they so grievously wounded, that piercing spear thrust, and they'll weep, oh, how they'll weep, deep mourning as of a parent grieving the loss of a firstborn child. The lamentation in Jerusalem that day will be massive, as famous as the lamentation over Hadad Rahman on the fields of Megiddo. Everyone will weep and grieve the land and everyone in it, the family of David off by itself and their women off by themselves, the family of Nathan off by itself and their women off by themselves, the family of Levi off by itself and their women off by themselves, the family of Shammai off by itself and their women off by themselves, and all the rest of the families off by themselves and their women off by themselves. So when I posted that scripture and message on X that day, I received a timestamp of 1055, which led me to Psalm 105, verse 5, which says, earnestly remember the marvelous deeds that he has done, his miracles and wonders, the judgments and sentences which he pronounced upon his enemies as in Egypt. So, all right. And then uh, on April 26, I was led to Esther 8, and I titled it, Start a Prayer Offensive Against the Enemy. After praying in the Spirit, Holy Spirit told me to open my Bible to a random page, I, which I did with my eyes closed like usual. Then he instructed me to turn 12 pages, and I was at Esther 8. And then I heard the Lord say in that still small voice, my people will have to take a stand against their enemies, but I will ensure their victory. And I wrote, we must go on a prayer offensive against our enemies. As we stand on the word of God, which are, which is his promises to us, he will fight for us and ensure our victory. He will turn sorrow into joy, mourning into great celebration and imminent death to vibrant life. In Esther 8, verses 11 through 17, in the message translation stood out to me. The king's order authorized the Jews in every city to arm and defend themselves to the death, killing anyone who threatened them or their women and children, and confiscating for themselves anything owned by their enemies. The day set for this in all King Xerxes' provinces was the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. The order was posted in public places in each province so everyone could read it, authorizing the Jews to be prepared on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers, fired up by the king's order, raced off on their royal horses. At the same time, the order was posted in the palace complex of Susa. Mordecai walked out of the king's presence, wearing a royal robe of violet and white, a huge gold crown, and a purple cape of fine linen. The city of Susa exploded with joy. For Jews, it was all good times and laughter. They celebrated. They were honored. It was that way all over the country, in every province, every city, when the king's bulletin was posted. The Jews took to the streets in celebration, cheering and feasting. Not only that, but many non-Jews became Jews. Now it was dangerous not to be a Jew. Okay, so prophetic numbers. When I posted that on X, I received a timestamp of 1102. So I looked up scripture just to see if it would confirm the message, and it did. And it um, was Luke 11, verse 2 in the CEV. So Jesus told them, pray in this way, Father, help us to honor your name. Come and set up your kingdom. And when I posted that confirmation on X, um, I received a timestamp of 1110. So that's 111, which represents Jesus, God's beloved son. And then um, as soon as I hit publish on the blog that day, um, I picked up my phone to go and post that blog post on um, X and True Social. And my phone said 1203, which is 123. <laughs> So God ordering my steps. Um, after I published the blog that day, I did listen to Julie Green. That's my usual habit um, is to have my morning time with the Lord and then post the scripture, the message everywhere, and then go and listen to see what Julie is saying for the day. And 
the Lord confirmed the message um, through Julie the same day. Okay. Um, so on April 27th, I was led to Job 11 and I titled it, let Holy Spirit be your guide. So after praying in the spirit and inviting father, son, and Holy Spirit, they led me to Job 11 for the fourth time. And I wrote, we must let Holy Spirit lead us as we provide comfort and counseling to those who are grieving. I feel this is going to be important for this time that we're coming into. So we're, we're the remnant here. We're tasked to be the salt and the light. So there's going to be people afraid and people grieving. Um, and so we have to be careful not to operate off of any assumptions and general truths about the ways of God and assume that we know their particular situation. We need to rely on Holy Spirit uh, to guide us. So I found some information, um, and let me see if I have the reference. Yeah. Okay. So there's, um, the source I used, it's called inspired scripture.com. And they did a Bible study there on, um, on this, on Job 11. And here's what they wrote. So invite Holy spirit to lead you when counseling someone who is experiencing grief. First, Zophar disagree, disagreed with Job's claims of innocence and then viciously attacked him. Spirit-led grief counseling instead requires patience and restraint. Second, Zophar offered hurtful comments to Job in his moment of desperation. Spirit-led grief counseling should instead offer compassion to the brokenhearted. Third, Zophar misrepresented God's love for his people and his advice was not rooted in love. Spirit-led grief counseling must also not misrepresent God and should be rooted in love. Fourth, Zophar then called Job an idiot for failing to repent. Spirit-led grief counseling must instead be rooted in kindness and encourage the brokenhearted. Fifth, Zophar relied on, upon his own beliefs and without any evidence to call Job a sinner. He then urged Job to repent. Spirit-led grief counseling counsel instead requires investigation, prayer, and the Holy Spirit before making accusations. Sixth, Zophar then made false promises that Job's confession of his hidden sins would force Job would force God to bring job the peace that he wanted he failed to understand that god's trials are not limited to sin spirit-led counseling should not make incorrect promises and should offer hope through faith in jesus finally zophar spoke presumptuously about sin when he was also a sinner spirit-led grief counseling should instead be rooted in humility <laughs> So I just thought that was um, interesting information, helpful information for helping people. Um, I've run into situations where friends will reach out and they're, you know, they're going through trials or testings and things and, you know, they're wanting advice. I think the best thing is to pray with them um, and prophesy blessings um and you know listen for holy spirit and see if there's anything that's coming up to be helpful but not to assume that they have open doors or sin in their life and things that they need to re be repenting about um just because they have trials and they, they got stuff going on so um on april 28th i was led to zechariah 6 again so this is twice this week i'm led there i um, titled it Jesus the branch is building the true temple so um, on this morning I woke up and turned off my alarm clock right at 9 11. I walked out to the kitchen to make coffee and my husband um, was asking me to watch a video about a boat um, that he wants to buy he's dreaming about a boat um, and so I looked out the sliding door of the back room where we were watching that about the boat for a few minutes and there was a huge host out there which i'll show you a picture of um, at the end here 
So then I headed off with my coffee and my Bible and went to my prayer closet and um, invited uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to lead me to scripture. And they led me to Zechariah 6 with my eyes closed. This is the fourth time, like I said. Um, and I was just there three days ago uh, when those horses were running loose through London. So Zechariah spoke of judgment, the four horses, the emissaries of God's judgment, but he also prophesied the branch, which is Jesus, will build the true temple of God's people, and he will rule as priest and king. So Zechariah 6 verses 12 through 13 in the Amplified stood out to me. Then say to Joshua, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, look, keep in sight, watch a man, Messiah, whose name is Branch, for he shall branch out from his place, Israel, the Davidic line, and he shall build the ultimate temple of the Lord. Yes, you are to build a temple of the Lord, but it is he who shall build the ultimate temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the honor and majesty as the only begotten of the Father, and sit and rule on his throne. And he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between the two offices, priest and king. So the branch is the triumphant Jesus, who Zechariah was shown would bring fruitfulness and new life to earth at a time far off in the future. And that future is the time we are now blessed to be living in. Amazing. Um, okay. I'm just looking at my notes here. I had a heck of a time uploading the pictures today. Like it was something else. I'm trying to get them from my phone to my computer. And the one, the one with the the being that I'm talking about, I didn't get it loaded, but now I'm looking and this is him. So you can see him. <laughs> I'll try to put him into the next video batch, but he didn't make it into this one. Sorry. I've got about like 50 other ones to show you. Um, when I posted this on today's, uh, on X on for today's scripture and message, um, I received a timestamp of 1045. So I looked up scripture to see if there was any confirmation there. And I found that Mark 1045 did confirm um, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. All right. And then when I posted on truth social, um, there was another confirmation through Jody. Um, um, Poder King doll. Um, at Poder 2022. Um, so seems like we're getting confirmation back and forth between the two of us with what the Lord's showing us, similar stuff. Um, okay, then on April 29th, there we go. On April 29th, I was led to Song of Solomon 6. Um, and I titled it, Jesus Adores His Bride, But the Enemy Fears Her. Okay. So on this morning, um, the enemy was really trying to interfere with the process. So I had to, I had to stop and take authority over the enemy and put him under my feet and then pray again and, and get back into the word. So he tried to lead me somewhere that's not even in the Bible. Like he was telling me, go to Haggai three, like, so I'm still kind of learning this, believe it or not. <laughs> I'm still kind of learning the scriptures. Um, and I get there and I go, there's no Haggai three. So I close my Bible and I'm like, okay. Hmm. So took authority over the enemy and then prayed again. And then this time with my eyes closed, I was led to song of Solomon six. And so I was like, mm, okay. I felt a little discombobulated. So I closed my Bible and I was like, okay, Holy Spirit, if that's you, if you really led me to Song of Solomon 6, lead me there again. So with eyes closed, opened it randomly, turned pages, I opened my eyes. I was on Song of Solomon 6. Crazy. Okay. So such good confirmation, you know, because the enemy can really like try to make you doubt and say like, you know, Holy Spirit's not showing you stuff. It's just random. 
you know, tries to, he tries to tell me those things. And I'm like, okay, no, because if you go to my blog and you look at just the, the, the messages and stuff and like the scriptures he's leading me to, it's not random. There's, there are messages and themes and confirmations left and right. So not, not listening to it. Okay. So anyway, so I read song of Solomon six and I started doing some research on it. Cause I feel like song of Solomon is talking about our relationship with Jesus. And I found um, a really beautiful teaching on this. And let me see where I got that. Okay. There's a website called test all things. And it's in line with like Holy Spirit filled and, you know, same beliefs that I have. So I went and read this and it was just beautiful. Um, And I wrote, the bride is beautiful in the eyes of the bridegroom, but terrible as an army with banners to the enemy. Our beauty should not be mistaken for weakness. We are preserved in the power of his might. So I'm going to read some of this to you. It's just gorgeous. This is a little bit lengthy, but worth it's worth it. So Song of Songs 6 verses 2 through 7. This is the Passion Translation. Um, My lover has gone down into his garden of delight to the flower beds of spices to feast with those pure in heart. I am fully devoted to my beloved and my beloved is fully devoted to me. Oh, my beloved, you are lovely. When I see you in your beauty, I see a radiant city where we will dwell as one. More pleasing than any pleasure, more delightful than any delight, you have ravished my heart, stealing away my strength to resist you. Even hosts of angels stand in awe of you. Turn your eyes from me. I can't take it anymore. I can't resist the passion of these eyes that I adore overpowered by a glance, my ravished heart undone, held captive by your love, I am truly overcome. For your undying devotion to me is the most yielded sacrifice. The shining of your spirit shows how you have taken my truth to become balanced and complete. Your beautiful blushing cheeks reveal how real your passion is for me, even hidden behind your veil of humility. So, There's a teaching on test all things that's called, I am my beloved's and he is mine. Um, And it goes like this. So it goes verse by verse. So my beloved is, my beloved is gone down into his garden to the beds of spices to feed in the gardens and to gather lilies. The bride answers simply by pointing them to Christ. This is what God given faith and perseverance is about looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. His garden is his church, which he has planted, which grows by his power and grace. He goes down because this shows the condescension that he experiences to save and preserve his church, God's elect, with his own precious blood. He has built his church upon the rock of his glorious person and finished work. He is the vine and his church is made up of the branches, all who believe in him. He continues to dwell with and within his people on earth by his spirit and his word. The idea here is not that he is feeding, but that he feeds his people with his spirit and his word. He waters his garden with the water of life and he gathers them as lilies in the field. And then Song of uh, Song of Solomon 6, verse 3, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. This is covenant language that describes a marriage union between Christ and his church. This is an eternal union that cannot be broken. Every true believer belongs to Christ as he purchased us with his own blood. And Christ belongs to every true believer as our Lord and our Savior. Every sinner saved by his grace can say with confidence, not only is Christ a savior, he is my savior. Not only is he Lord, he is my Lord. This union binds us together as one body, his bride, his church. 
Again, the idea of his feeding among the lilies is that he feeds his people with his word, as he himself is the lily of the valley, pure and white, his people are, are so in him, as we are made the righteousness of God in him. Christ came down to suffer for our sins imputed to him and to work out by his death for us a perfect righteousness that is imputed to us. This is the ground of our justification and the source of our new birth and spiritual life in and in growth and grace and in the knowledge of Christ. And then verse four, thou art beautiful, O my love, as Terza, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. Now the bride, having sought her bridegroom, now finds him and begins to speak to her and of her in the poetic language of grace. She is beautiful again, not because of any natural beauty, but because of what she is and what she has in and from him by his power and grace. As sinners saved by grace, our beauty is his beauty. Terza may refer to an ancient city in Canaan that was known for its beauty. Jerusalem obviously refers to the heavenly Jerusalem, which is the church of the living God because the physical city of Jerusalem was anything but beautiful in the eyes of the Lord. The true bride, the true church, is beautiful in the eyes of her bridegroom, but terrible as an army with banners to her enemies. Her beauty is not to be mistaken for weakness. She is protected, preserved, and, and she perseveres in the strength of her husband, in the power of his might. Neither the world, the flesh, nor the devil can defeat her. For Christ is her victory. And then verse five, turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Gilead. This is an expression of intense love, not of dislike or disgust. Christ tells her to turn her eyes away from him because such love consumes his own heart. He uses the same symbol here that he uses in Song of Solomon 4 verse 1. This is not to be taken literally because as sinners saved by grace, we are never to look away from our Lord and Savior. Our whole life of faith is looking constantly to him who is our life and the supreme object of our love. This is a poetic way of expressing the intensity of his love for us. Again, as in Song of Solomon 4 verse 1, when speaking of her hair, the idea is not that her hair is like the hair of a goat, but it is that her hair beautifully flows down her head like the black-haired flock of goats flowing down from Mount Gilead. So the bridegroom speaks of his bride's beauty. And then verses six and six and seven, thy teeth are as a flock of sheep which go up from the washing whereof every one beareth twins. And there is not one barren among them as a piece of pomegranate are thy temples within thy locks. So obviously this person used the King James version of the, of the scripture. Again, we see the same symbols of her beauty as written in Song of Solomon 4 verses 1 through 3. The reason he repeats these words is because as sinners saved by grace, we need a constant reminder of our standing before God in Christ, washed in his blood and clothed in his righteousness. We also need to know our state in this world as his true people, his bride, and that even though we are in the world, we are not of the world. As we struggle in our own personal warfare between our flesh and the spirit, as we struggle against the world and Satan, we have a tendency to forget what we are in Christ by his grace and power and what we can do through him who is our life and power. So as stated in Song of Solomon 4 verse 1 through 3, the teeth being washed as is a metaphor for the mouth through which the heart speaks. The testimony of the bride is the pure word of God in the gospel. Even our words are washed clean in the blood of Christ. The bearing of twins speaks of the fruitfulness of God's word, which will always accomplish the purpose for which God sends it. The temples refer to the minds of God's people. 
and the pomegranate symbols symbolizes the fertility of God's promise of salvation and the biblical concepts of knowledge, learning, and wisdom, qualities that come by the revelation of truth from the understanding of the scriptures. So that's an amazing, very anointed um, teaching on Song of Solomon. Very good. Um, so thank you to, who did I say that was from? <laughs> that was from, Test All Things. Couldn't remember it for a second. Thank you to whoever wrote that on test all things. Okay. So when I posted that on X, um, I received a timestamp of 12, which led me to Psalm 12. So Psalm 12, help Lord, save us for godly ones are disappearing. Where are the dependable principled ones? They're a vanishing breed. Everyone lies. Everyone flatters. Everyone deceives. Nothing but empty talk, smooth talk, and double talk. You will destroy every proud liar who says, we lie all we want, our words are our weapons, and we won't be held accountable. Who can stop us? May Yahweh cut off their twisted tongues and seal their lying lips. May they all be silenced, those who boast and brag with their high-minded talk. But the Lord says, now I will arise, I will defend the poor, those who were plundered, the oppressed, and the needy who groan for help that will spring into action to rescue and protect them. For every word Yahweh speaks is sure and reliable. His truth is tested, found to be flawless and ever faithful. It's a pure as silver refined seven times in a crucible of clay. Lord, you will keep us safe out of the reach of the wicked, even though they strut and prowl, tolerating and celebrating what is worthless and vile you will still lift up those who are yours. All right, so April 30th, I was led to Mark 7, and I titled it, We Will Perform Even Greater Miracles in Jesus' Name. So after praying in the Spirit, Holy Spirit led me to Mark 7. This is for the second time. And I wrote, doing the opposite of legalism, Jesus healed people in a multitude of ways in order to demonstrate that it is not a particular method of praying or laying on of hands that heals, but that it is the de it is dependent upon the sovereign power of God. So Mark 7, 29 through 35 in the Amplified stood out. And he said to her, because of this answer, reflecting your humility and faith, go knowing that your request is granted. The demon has left your daughter permanently and returning to her home, she found the child lying on the couch, relaxed and resting, the demon having gone. Soon after this, Jesus left the region of Tyre and passed through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, through the region of Decapolis, the 10 Hellenistic cities. They brought to him a man who was deaf and had difficulty speaking, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. Jesus, taking him aside by himself away from the crowd, put his fingers into the man's ears, and after spitting, he touched the man's tongue with the saliva, and looking up to heaven, he sighed deeply and said to the man, Ephatha, which in Aramaic means be opened and released. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he began speaking plainly. So throughout his ministry, um, Jesus used many different ways of healing. He healed with a word. He healed without a word. He healed in response to one's faith. He healed in response to the faith of another. He healed those who asked. He healed those who he approached. So Jesus didn't want to be tied down to any one method to show that his power was not dependent on any method, but on the sovereign power of God. And in each case, he adapted his approach to the need of the person. So I got that from Enduring Word. And I wrote, Jesus was moved with compassion and displayed the heart of his father in heaven as he ministered to people. He said, we will do greater works. We too must not adhere to specific methods, but with faith and trust, standing on the promises of God in his written word, we must lay hands on the afflicted and pray according to the specific needs of each person. 
in John 14, verse 12, in the Passion Translation stood out to me. I tell you these timeless truth. I tell you this timeless truth. The person who follows me in faith, believing in me, will do the same mighty miracles that I do, even greater miracles than these, because I go to be with my Father. All right, so we're getting close to the end. A couple more days, and then we'll show the pictures. May 1st, I was led to Song of Solomon 7, how Jesus views his people. So interesting to be led back there again the same week. So the Lord's definitely wanting to share this information. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit led me with my eyes closed to Song of Solomon 7. Um, and this, I wrote, this chapter is a beautiful description of how Christ views his people. In my research, I found this incredibly anointed teaching. And I couldn't say it any better. So I just included it um, and gave the credit to the person. So I'm going to um, read this to you. So Song of Solomon 7. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter. The joints of thy thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands of a cunning workman. The navel is like a round goblet, which wanteth not liquor. Thy belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. Thy neck is a tower of ivory, thine eyes like the fish pools in Heshbon by the gate of Bath Rabim. Thy nose is as the tower of Lebanon, which looketh toward Damascus. Thine head upon thee is like Carmel, and the hair of thine head like purple. The king is held in the galleries. How fair and how pleasant art thou, O love for delights! This thy stature is like a, like to a palm tree, and thy breast to clusters of grapes. I said, I will go up to the palm, up to the palm tree. I will take hold of the bows thereof. Now also thy breast shall be as clusters of the vine, and the smell of thy nose like apples, and the roof of thy mouth like the best wine for my beloved, that goeth down sweetly, be causing the lips of those that are asleep to speak. Okay, so. In verse one, how beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter. The joints of thy thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands of a cunning workman. The apostle Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, Ephesus, there we go. The apostle Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus concerning the whole army of God, that by God's grace through Christ, we stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Feet with shoes speaks of our walk. Christ has made our feet beautiful by his grace and power to cause us to walk by faith in him and to walk in his word, giving glory to him. In Christ and based on his righteousness alone by the power of the Holy Spirit, we who believe in him like Enoch of old walk with God. This means fellowship and security. It also means the beauty of holiness, which is the beauty of Christ given to us. And then, um, O oh, Prince's daughter, here is another name Christ gives to his bride. This is one Hebrew word as used in Song of Solomon 6, verse 12, Nadib which means inclined or willing. Christ's bride is made willing whenever he gives her a heart and willingness to believe and follow him and submit to him as the Lord of our righteousness. The joints of thy thighs are like jewels. The thighs represent the strength by which we stand on our feet. The strength is the power and grace of God in Christ. Paul wrote, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. When the Apostle Paul sought the Lord to rid him of his thorn in the flesh, the Lord revealed that his grace and power were sufficient. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He wrote in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. We who are in Christ stand firm on him who is our rock. We shall not be moved. The work of the hands of a cunning workman. True believers are the workmanship of God, 
who is a skilled and masterful workman. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We are not self-made. We are sinners saved securely and eternally by God's grace in Christ. We are justified in him and redeemed by him. Our spiritual life and faith are his works within us. So um, verse two, thy navel is like a round goblet, which wanteth not liquor. So the navel is the umbilical cord that by which a baby is sustained and nourished. Solomon says the navel is like a cup full of wine, refreshing and invigorating. It is well shaped and full of life, not uncut, bleeding and loathsome like it was when he found us. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 3 verse 8 that the fear of the Lord is said to be health to the navel. The goblet is the cup of salvation that is full and runneth over with God's grace, power and love. The fullness of God of the Godhead dwells in Christ bodily, and we are complete in him. Thy belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. The wheat refers to the fruitfulness, and it is connected with the belly because it feeds our hunger for Christ and righteousness in him. The lilies refer to the beauty of righteousness and pleasantness of life. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. This refers to the word of God, the Old and New Testaments, like twin fawns full of life as they point us to Christ for all salvation, forgiveness, righteousness, and life. They are in perfect agreement, showing forth the riches, the glory, and the grace of God in Christ. Verse 4, thy neck is a tower of ivory. The faith of God's elect by which we are joined to Christ, our head, is both strong and precious. It guides our way as we walk by faith and look to Christ. Thine eyes, like the fish pools in Heshbon by the gate of bath -Rabim. Our eyes are blessed by God to see his glory in Christ. These are eyes of faith that look to him and eyes of repentance that look away from self and our works. They are eyes blessed with love and devotion, sincerity and truth. The eyes that weep over sin are as beautiful fountains in the eyes of Christ. Thy nose is as the tower of Lebanon, which looketh toward Damascus. This speaks of the boldness and courage of the church in facing her enemies in the cause of Christ. And then verse five, thine head upon thee is like Carmel and the hair of thine head like purple and the king is held in the galleries christ is our head as christ uh, christ our head is exalted above the earth and reigns as king over all the earth and the hair of thine head like purple the king is held in the galleries a woman's beauty is in her head and the hair of her head is her glory even so christ our head is our great glory and beauty we have no beauty except that we have except what we have in and from him and his greatest beauty is seen in his agony at the cross when his hair was dyed crimson with blood and he was robed in purple verse six how fair and how pleasant art thou o love for delights as his bride is an object of his mercy and he delights to show mercy he loves her in light of that mercy as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride so shall your god rejoice over you as it says in Isaiah 62. Verse seven, this thy stature is like to a palm tree and thy breast to cluster of grapes. He compares her to the tall and noble palm tree. He has made her a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. The cluster of grapes refers to the fruits of righteousness, spiritual life, faith, repentance, and perseverance unto glory. God's righteousness is both the ground of salvation, justification, and the source of spiritual life. Verse 8, I said, I will go up to the palm tree. I will take hold of the bows thereof. Now also thy breast shall also be as clusters of the vine and the smell of thy nose like apples. Christ ascending the palm tree is expressive of his right to his church. It is his church 
which he has by his father's gift, his own purchase and the power of his grace. He is the head of the church and is always present with her. He takes hold of her branches, meaning he keeps, controls, and guides her. Her breast as clusters of grapes expresses his delight in her, in her viewing her stature and fruit, which flourishes by his grace and power. Her, her nose and the apples refer to the sweet and fruitful fragrance of his word upon which she feasts. And one more verse, verse nine, and the roof of thy mouth, like the best wine for my beloved that goeth down sweetly, causing the lips of those who that are asleep to speak. The roof of her mouth and the best wine refer to her taste by which in the power of Christ, she distinguishes between the truth and a lie. The word of God goes down sweetly. This is the gospel and the whole world. world <laughs> this is the gospel and the whole world word of God leading souls directly to Christ, his person, blood, righteousness, and sacrifice for peace, pardon, justification, reconciliation, assurance, and motivation for obedience. The gospel in the power of the spirit is the wake-up call for spiritually dead sinners who are brought by the spirit and the word to come by faith to Christ and repent of dead works. It is also a wake-up call to believers who have fallen asleep and need to be awakened to serve and witness the truth. And so that was written by W. Parker, and that was from Test All Things again. So two good teachings on Song of Solomon from Test All Things. So thank you to Test All Things. Thank you, Mr. Parker or Miss Parker. Not sure if it's male or female. Okay. May 2nd, so this was today, um, I was led to Isaiah 24, and I titled it, In One Hour, God is Going to Change Everything. So after praying the Spirit and taking authority over the spiritual atmosphere, which I do each time, Holy Spirit had me open my Bible randomly and instructed me to turn 12 pages to Isaiah 24. And this is the second time I've been led to this scripture, and I feel like the 24 represents 2024. So this is that scripture, just for reference, as we talk more about it. Um, Behold, the Lord will make the land and the earth empty and make it waste and turn it upside down. Twist the face of it and scatter abroad its inhabitants. And it shall be as what happens with the people so that the priest as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. The land and the earth shall be utterly laid waste and utterly pillaged, for the Lord has said this. The land and the earth mourn and wither, the world languishes and withers, the high ones of the people and the heavens with the earth languish. The land and the earth also are defiled by their inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, disregarded the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the land and the earth, and they who dwell in it suffer the punishment of their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the land and the earth are scorched and parched under the curse of God's wrath, and few people are left. The new wine mourns, the vine languishes, all the merrymakers sigh. The mirth of the timbrels is stilled. The noise of those who rejoice ends. The joy of the lyre of the lyre is stopped. No more will they drink wine with a song. Strong drink will be bitter to those who drink it. The wasted city of emptiness and confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up so that no one may enter there is crying in the streets for wine all joy is darkened the mirth of the land is banished and gone into captivity in the city is left desolation and its gate is battered and destroyed for for so shall it be in the midst of the earth among the peoples as the shaking and beating of an olive tree or as the gleaning when the vintage is done and only a small amount of the fruit remains but those who have escaped and remain, lift up their voices, they shout. For the majesty of the Lord, they cry aloud from the Mediterranean Sea. 
Wherefore, glorify the Lord in the east, whether in the region of daybreaks, lights, and fires, or in the west, glorify the name of the Lord, the God of Israel in the isles and coasts of the Mediterranean Sea. From the uttermost parts of the earth have we heard songs, glory to the righteous one and to the people of Israel. But I say, emaciated, I pine away, I pine away, woe is me. The treacherous dealers deal treacherously. Yes, the treacherous dealers deal very treacherously. Terror and pit of destruction and snare are upon you, O inhabitant of the earth. And he who flees at the noise of the terror will fall into the pit, and he who comes up out of the pit will be caught in the snare. For the windows of the heavens are opened as in the deluge, and the foundations of the earth tremble and shake. Feeling Holy Spirit right now. The earth is utterly broken, the earth is rent asunder, the earth is shaken violently. The earth shall stagger like a drunken man and shall sway to and fro like a hammock. Its transgression shall lie heavily upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. And in that day, the Lord will visit and punish the host of the high ones on high, the host of heaven in heaven, celestial beings, and the kings of the earth on the earth. And they will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in a pit or dungeon. They will be shut up in prison, and after many days, they will be visited, inspected, and punished or pardoned. Then the moon will be confounded and the sun ashamed when they compare their ineffectual fire to the light of the Lord of hosts, who will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders will show forth his glory. So I wrote very soon in one hour, God is going to change the whole world, the church and each one of us individually. His remnant will rise from the ashes singing his praises. So when I was studying this this morning, I came across a teaching. Let me see if I... I came across a teaching from David and Gary Wilkerson at World Challenge called In One Hour, Everything is Going to Change. And I took this excerpt from it. There will be panic everywhere. Men's hearts will fail them for fear as fires belch smoke seen for hundreds of miles. Disorder and chaos will reign on all sides. Yet amid the devastating fires and calamity, the world will hear a glorious song being sung. Glorify ye the Lord in the fires, even the name of the Lord God of Israel. From the uttermost part of the earth have we heard songs, even glory to the righteous one. A holy remnant is going to awaken and a song will be born in the fire. Instead of panicking, the people of God will be praising his awesome majesty. Imagine it, in the darkest hour of all time, a collective voice will rise by the millions out of every nation, not in fear or agony, but in joyful praise to the Lord. How will this happen, you ask? In one hour, God is going to regenerate and restore his church. Dry bones will shake and rattle and the righteous will be awakened as the Holy Spirit calls multitudes of lukewarm believers back to their first love. In his mercy, he's going to rouse those who have neglected him, ignoring his word, avoiding prayer, perhaps even contemplating divorce. Suddenly their souls will be flooded with the pangs of remorse and godly sorrow, and many will fall on their knees crying out in repentance. There will be a revival of glorifying God's majesty, and the song of this revival will be heard from the uttermost parts of the earth. Paul instructs, arm yourself with faith, build up your belief now before the day comes. Learn your song, and you'll be able to sing it in your fire. Glorify ye the Lord in the fires, even the name of the Lord God of Israel. This is the hope of our most holy faith our lord causes a song to come out of the darkest of times so that's about where we're at and then when i turned on julie green today after um being led there sh the lord basically confirmed that through her um but i wanted to 
just remind you that we've also heard from Manuel Johnson that it's glory days, not gloomy days. So don't be sad. Don't be fearful. Just trust in the Lord. All right. So anyway. So let's look at some pictures. We're just going to go one by one here. Um, so just a reminder that um, I will have these on my blog. Some of these are not yet on there. They will be. Um, it's kind of kind of crazy keeping up with the number of them. Some days I go out and there's just an extraordinary number and I can't stop taking pictures. Um Anyway, so I'm just going to just bear with me and I will just follow my cursor and I will um, explain what you're looking at here to help you see. Okay, so here we have a host. So I'm in my front yard and I'm looking up over my roof and this guy's looking down at me. So here's an eye in this area right here and another eye is over here. You can see his nose right here and you can see his big lips right here. So now you know where the eyes, nose, and lips are. Back out, you can see him. He was just kind of checking me out over my garage. Okay, and then last week when I was doing a video, um, last week, um, the last time I did a video, I went outside afterwards and this was over top of my roof. <laughs> so keep me in your prayers. <laughs> lots of, I see lots of warfare going on around here. Um, I mean, honestly, it doesn't really affect my family because I keep us covered um, in the blood of Jesus and armored up and I pray. Um, but keep me in your prayers nonetheless. There's this guy here. I'm not sure if this is a host. I, I don't know what I'm looking at here sometimes. If there's some, if some of this is good and evil, like if it's just duking it out up here, what's happening? But um, you can see this guy here. So here's his eye, his nose. You're looking at him. He's looking to the left. Here's his mouth, his chin. So here's his neck here. Okay hair so he's he's mean looking but you know some of the hosts really are pretty mean looking so it's hard for me to tell sometimes what's what you've got one here too um and these this looks like a host and they have a lot of eyes and sometimes they have multiple faces or they're stacked so like you can see several um, stacked here. You can see like their eyes, nose, eyes, nose, mouth. Here's a mouth right here. Here's eyes. So it's going to be very interesting to get to heaven someday and, and see what these actually look like. Um, or even, you know, before I go to heaven, if I'm... Um, the Lord takes me up there to show me some of what some of these things really look like. There's a host up here or something, the spirit of some kind. Here's the eyes, nose, mouth. It's got a, a beard. So lots going on in this picture. There's something here. I don't know if this is a, a demonic spirit or if this is a host. Here's a mouth, nose, eyes. Anyway, so there's a picture of this with drawing on it. It'll be on my blog so you can see. What, uh, what else is going on up there? Okay, so this one um, is like a face-off here. So um, I wonder if I have a drawing. I might have a drawing for this one. Let me see if I do. Some of these I grabbed a drawing. Mm, let's see. Just going to check and see if I, I might not have a drawing for that one. Okay. Alrighty. No drawing for this one, but I'll just kind of point out. So on the left here is a big host. 
So here's the nose right here. Here's the lips, the chin, neck, eyes right here. And I don't know what it's got on top of his head, if it's got like a lot of hair or if it's got something. This looks like a goat to me up here at the top. So you can see an eye, eye, nose, mouth, and it's got like some horns or something up there. A little bit hard to see, but, and then right here on the right is another host. So here's the eye, it's looking, it's looking to the left. So it's looking at this guy, they're looking at each other. Here's the eye, nose, here's the mouth. Okay, and it's either got a beard or it's got like another host. It looks like another, like a, almost like a horse shaped host at the bottom of it, like in its beard right here. You can see an eye and nose, mouth. So it's interesting. All right, so hopefully y'all can see that. Um, on my blog, it'll have a picture. I believe I've posted this one already and there's a picture with me uh, that I've drawn on so you can see better if you're, if you're having trouble seeing, but host here on the left, host here on the right. And there's one right here too. So it's like two of them facing off this other guy. This is a host, um, and here's the eye right here. Almost looks like it has its eye closed. Here's the nose, and here's its lips right here. Almost looks like a lot of these remind me of like Planet of the Apes. <laughs> They kind of have an ape look to them to me. Um, here's the neck and he's looking up. Looking up or like has his face up but his eye looks closed. So he's, he's this is his profile. He's looking to the left. Let's see y'all can see that. And then this one, this is a host. Um, here's his eye. It's another eye. This is his nose and his mouth is right here. So he's in profile. Looks like he's got a big ear right here. And actually there's like a, a host right here in his ear. <laughs> oftentimes you see like a host within the eye of a host or the ear of a host or <laughs> they're so multifaceted it's amazing anyway so there he is and um this is something, uh, I don't know if it's a host or evil spirit, but um, you can see like the eye right here, the nose, this is the nostril. You can see its mouth, chin, neck, and it looks like it has something on top of it. I don't know if it has like a dragon on top of it. it looks like it might be like an evil spirit with a dragon on top of it. This could be a dragon up here. There's an eye. And the snout, there's the mouth. Or it could just be two hosts. Not sure. It's definitely something. And this looks like an evil spirit to me. This is the eye right here. Here's the nose and the mouth. Um, so kind of looks a little bit creepy.
and this is a host in profile. So he's looking to the left and here's his eye and his nose in this area, his mouth. And here's another one, kind of interesting looking. Here's his eye. This might be his nose right here. Here's his mouth. It looks like he's breathing or there's some breath or something coming out of his mouth. Um, This one, I put some drawing on so you could see them a little bit better. Here's the, where you're gonna look for the eye here, the nose, mouth, chin, okay. okay. Here's without the drawing. So you can kind of make them out now. So here's the eye, nose area, mouth, chin, big host up there. This one I did drawing on also, so you could see in the next picture. This one reminds me of the Grinch that stole Christmas. So we'll look at the next picture. Doesn't that look like the Grinch? You can see his eye so clearly. There's his eye right there. Isn't that amazing? So. That is a big host. He was pretty big up there. He's looking down. So this is eye, forehead is right here, nose, mouth in this area. Some days they mostly look like puffy cloud hosts. So on this day, we've got three of them up here, or there's probably more, but three main ones that I can see. So you've got this one. You, I look for the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. So this one here, here's eyes, nose area. This is the mouth. So they're just kind of hanging up up there. And then there's this one kind of down here. So this one. You can see his eyes in this area, nose area. Here's his mouth. So sometimes they look like that. Let's see. My husband and I went up to Safety Harbor to have dinner and saw this up there. This looks like a fox. So you can see the eye right here, got a long snout, nose at the end, and a mouth. Here's its chin. So. Also saw, so as we were driving down the road, we saw several hosts. So here you can see a big host coming out of this cloud right here. So you see his nose right here, his mouth right here. His eyes a little bit hard to see. This might be his eye, but not amazing. Then there was this big, like, dragon-looking thing. I don't know if this is a dragon. I don't know what this was. It was huge. Got some amazing video of this thing. It looks like a dinosaur. 
So here's the eye, here's the mouth. Had a very long neck and um, it had a, a big body like that went across the sky with like wings. So it was like a flying dragon, it was wild. I'm like, am I seeing this stuff? This is crazy. So on this one, you can see um, the blue up here is the sky, and you can just see spirits coming out of these clouds here. Like they were almost like over the car. Can you see these faces? So here's like eye, mouth. Here's eyes, nose, mouth. You can see the hair flying. It was wild. They're right over the water. So it makes you think like, are they, are they marine spirits? What are they, you know? Or are they hosts? You can see like in this area right here, a bunch of faces. I don't know if those are demons. I'm not sure what those are. Um, but... I drew on this one so you could see this is a really big host right here. And there's something over here. It's like they're facing off. So I'll show you the next picture. But this is where you'll look for the eyes, the mouth. Um, and then there's something over here that's facing off with it. So these are the eyes right here, the mouth in this area here. This one's a little bit harder to see. Like in real life, you you could see it and you're just like, wow, huge. Um, and there's something over here that it's facing off with. And then in the next one, so I got drawing on this one for you. There's a face down here with lips and like a beard or something. There's a few different things going on here. So I'll get to the one that doesn't have drawing. And you can see it. I mean, so like you can see the, the eyes, the nose, so you can see the nostril right there, the mouth. Um, okay, I want to focus on this guy down here. You see these lips right here? <laughs> Clear as day. Those are like human lips. Here's the nose, nostril. The eyes are in this area right here. So now you're kind of oriented. Can you see him? He's like doing this, like he's pouting at me. I wonder what these hosts think. I'm down there taking pictures of them. All right, and then there's this one. So there's a big host here and a smaller guy down here that's yelling. So kind of orient you to the features and I'll show you the next picture of it. So you can see the, this is the eye right here. This is the nose area. Here's the mouth. So if we just focus in on him for a minute, he's kind of, reminds me of the one that I saw over my roof that was just really fierce. Some of these hosts just like are warriors. They just look really mean. So here's the eye. Now I say, this is the eye. But we've heard from Cat Kerr, they have multiple eyes. So for all we know, these are all could be eyes on this guy. He could he could be full of eyeballs. Um, the Lord likes eyes and apparently likes books. Some one of the prophets um 
visited um, like a library or something in heaven, and the Lord, like a room full of books. And the Lord's like, why, why do you think there's so many books in here? And the prophet was like, I don't know, Lord. And he said, cause I like books. <laughs> If you're God and you like books, I suppose you can have like a million gajillion, probably more than we can count. He's probably, he's got a book on everybody plus probably everything. So amazing. Anyway, so that's the host. And then look at this guy down here. Here's his eye. Here's his nose. His mouth is wide open. He is screaming. He sees this big guy coming at him and he's like, I am toast toast okay so when you say um go host make toast that's what you're calling in right there all right so let me look and see if i have more i think i do a couple more Let's see um, i have one with drawing on it but this one um is a is a, i call them like a puffy cloud host Here's the eyes, nose area. He's got a mouth and a big long beard. I know some of these people are people are probably looking at these going, oh my God, this lady has lost her mind. She, these are just clouds, but they're not, they're hosts. And I hope this one loaded that I'm looking for because it, it's as clear as day, this picture of a man, but where is it? I don't think he loaded. I might have to show him to you next time. That's interesting. I'm just going to browse through and see if he's here because he didn't load. Dang. He was clear as day. Let's see if I can find him. I'm going to see if I can find him on my phone and just show him to you. He was interesting he didn't load all the other pictures did he looks like um someone who oh there's a few of them that didn't load well that's too bad i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to show these next time but this guy I don't know if you can, the reflection is getting you let's see you can see his eyes and his face I'm so sad that he didn't load. You can see his eyes super clearly. You can probably see him from there, even though the, the picture's not the greatest. <laughs> Trying to do this. Oh, darn. I don't know if you can see him. All right. So there's a few of them that didn't um, load, which is really interesting because I definitely loaded them. Let me check one more time. This... I had a little bit of interference here today. Let's see. Oh my goodness. No, I don't see him. Darn. Well, I don't see him, but we do have this guy. This is the last one I'll show. There's a few, there's a there's a few more that didn't get loaded. This program's a little persnickety, like it'll let you load so many pictures and then it kind of just boots some of them out. Like, okay, this is your limit or something. Anyway, that's why I don't show like a lot of them with drawing on them because it really, it starts booting things out for me. Anyway, this is a host that looks like he has multiple eyes, but the main eye I think is right here. Here's his nose and you can even see a nostril right here. And here's his mouth. And looks like he's got breath coming out of his mouth. So you can see him right there. So, and when you look up at the sky to see these things, like they really stand out. It's not like just a regular cloud. It's like, you know, sometimes there's nothing else going on. You just have that going on right there. Anyway, well, I'm sad a couple of those didn't show up for you. Bummer. Okay, so I'll just mark those to show them next time. Um, so I just want to take this moment to invite any of you who are watching um, that have never asked 
Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior. Um, it's the best decision that you could ever make. It's life changing. It brings so much blessings into your life. Um, and, you know, when you ask him to be your personal Lord and Savior, he actually steps into you and you have the indwelling spirit of the Lord inside of you. So it helps you in your everyday walk um, to, to do the right thing. It literally like changes you things that it's like things that you used to think you no longer think things that you used to want to spend time doing you no longer want to do those things um it's like righteousness steps inside you um and really honestly you know just to give you a little story um so there's somebody that i felt that the lord wanted me to invite to accept Jesus into her heart. And I did that out of obedience, um, not knowing in her, not knowing at the time that she had ovarian cancer, advanced stage ovarian cancer. And shortly after that, she would, um, be diagnosed with that and, and had to have surgery. And initially the recovery was going pretty good, but then things went off the rails and she became confused and nonverbal and basically got a bad infection after. So now she's fighting that. So we're praying for her, but I'm so glad that I was obedient to the Lord and led her to Jesus because Jesus is the only way to heaven. Um, so I'm praying for her recovery, but I know in my heart of hearts that all is well because even if she goes home, she's going home to the Lord. Um, if that happens, um, and I can rest in peace in my own soul that I was obedient. I didn't ignore that, that, you know, that leading or, you know, that I don't even want, want to call it. It's like just that urge that I needed to do that because I would feel really bad because now she can't do it because she can't speak right now. So I'm glad I did that. So you just never know. You just don't know when it's going to be, you know, like my son's up at school and someone that they know um, was just standing at the side of the road and someone plowed into her at 60 miles an hour and killed her. So I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. Remember, it's glory days, not gloomy days. I'm not trying to be gloom and doom. What I'm trying to say is you just don't know. You don't know what tomorrow brings. And if you don't know in your heart that you're going to heaven, you're not 100% sure that that's where you're going, just say this prayer with me. Repeat this after me. You have to say it with your words. Father God, I recognize I am a sinner. I come to you asking forgiveness of my sins. I confess in my heart and speak with my mouth that Jesus Christ is your son. And he died on the cross for my sins. I confess Jesus as the Lord of my heart, my soul, and my life. I accept Jesus as my personal savior. And I praise you for making a way for me. I declare by the blood of Jesus, I am saved. Jesus, I invite you into my life and I pray you continue to reveal your love to me by your Holy Spirit. I ask you to have your way with my life and I thank you for making me into a new creation. So if you said that, welcome to the family. So I'm going to close this out by um, using one of the decrees here from Brenda Kuhneman's Daily Decrees for Government and for Nations, and it's called Heavenly Perspective Upon the Nation. I'm trying to waste up my phone. So just be in agreement with me as I pray this. Okay. So 
heavenly perspective upon the nation. We decree that the people and believers of the United States shall receive divine revelation and heaven's perspective. We prophesy that the citizens of this country shall hear and know the truth. In Jesus' name, we say that they shall not be dissuaded by the lies perpetrated through the media, political figures, activists, and special interests. We bind the work of the God of this world who would blind their minds and keep the light of the gospel from shining onto them. We declare that those who resist and refuse the truth shall lose their influence and be exposed in their deceptions. We call for opening the eyes and ears of every person, family, Christian, community leader, and political figure. We say they are open to what God is saying in this hour. We prophesy that biblical truth and prophetic insight shall be welcomed in the people's hearts and minds. We decree a new perspective about the future shall arise, and this nation shall clearly see God's redemptive plan for of good that is being extended to humanity. Men and women everywhere shall herald and promote God's word of life. We decree people shall turn to God and to his perspective in all things, and heaven's perspective shall mightily prevail in Jesus' name. And the scripture will stand on in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 in the King James Version in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. So, awesome. So, amen to that. And don't forget, glory days, not gloomy days. Stand in your authority. Stand on the word. Resist the devil, he must flee. Don't put up with any garbage from the devil. I will see you guys on the next video. Love you.